holiness, holiness is what I long for, holiness is what I need, holiness, holiness is what you want for me. So take my mind and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will and conform it to yours, to yours, oh Lord. Holiness. Holiness is what I long for. Holiness, what do you need? Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will and conform it to yours, to yours, oh Lord. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, oh Lord. Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness what you want from me so take my mind and form it take my mind and form it take my will conform it to yours to yours oh lord holiness holiness is what you want for holiness is what i need holiness holiness is what you want from me There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. Take the time to receive it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. So take the time to receive it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing in this house 
waiting for you. There's a healing in this house waiting for you. There's a healing in this house waiting for you. Take the time to receive it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. There is joy in this house waiting for you. There is joy in this house waiting for you. Take the time to receive it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. Take the time to receive it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. Uh, bless the Lord at all Of the Lord, Amen, Amen. Um, just uh, ask, uh, pray for me for Friday night. Uh, I, um, um, I accepted two engagements last year, not expecting to uh, be laboring uh, under such conditions, but um, the Lord will make a way. You know, my cousin Charles, I mean, I don't know if y'all know Charles Grant or not. Um, Joan and uh, Charles and uh, Ray and Pam. Amen. Amen. And Charles tell me every time he see me, he said, Webb, he said, Lord, make a way somehow. And, 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 and I'm thankful for that. But um, uh, just, just pray much for me. Choir, y'all come ready to... To, to worship, amen, and uh, we pray that the Lord will uh, help me to uh, uh, give me the strength to uh, deliver a word, amen. Granddad always told me, said, boy, if you don't do nothing, get up and read 23rd Psalm. <laughs> he said, that's enough. You get up and read it and take your seat, amen. But uh, we are real thankful uh, uh, today. Uh, Hey man, I have a testimony, but I'll, I'll wait for, for uh, maybe next Sunday. Uh, I 
to give it uh, because, uh, amen, uh, Lord, um, Lord has really blessed me, and, 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 uh, and I'm appreciative uh, for everything that he has done, amen, uh, two o'clock in the morning to four is my worship time, amen, most of you sound asleep. I'll turn it over, getting ready to give a second. Amen. That, that's, that's my worship time. Everything is quiet. That's before the rooster crows. Amen. Early in the morning. Like nothing's moving. Every, every, everything is still. And, uh, and I worship and praise uh, the Lord till around 4, 430. And then I take a nap. Amen. But uh, within those hours, somewhere, God has moved. Amen. He has moved. You know, he got a way of turning things around. Yes, he does. Amen. They, things may be looking good one day, and the next day they're not looking so good. And, and um, you receive a diagnosis from your doctors and... Uh, and um, you know you get down for a little while, and and uh, God turn around, and turn things around, Amen. And lets us know that He is God, Amen, Amen. So, but uh, I'm not going to take up your time. There's a preacher in the house, a friend, a brother, and no stranger to us from Mount Perrin Baptist Church, Washington D.C. under the leadership of uh, Pastor Lawson. Amen. Uh, I called him. Uh, I thought I was going to be having in gear this morning, ready, ready to crank it up and get going, but uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm not able to do it today. But um, Green uh, Richard is a good friend of mine. Amen. A very good friend of mine. Uh, he want me to come out and get on that boat, but I won't go. Yeah. As a matter of fact, every time I call this dude, man, what are you doing, man? I'm out here on the boat fishing. I said, you see any land? No, I don't see no land. Oh, uh, God bless you, then, because uh, Smith and, Smith and Smith's not coming out there with you. Amen. I tell him, fishing on land, fishing on the sea. Fishing on the lands, the fishing for me. Amen. But we are thankful uh, that uh, Minister Green... Uh, and I called him. He said, Rodney, you know, I'd do anything for you. Amen. I don't have a lot of friends, honestly. You know, my circle is very small. Amen. But uh, God is in the midst. Amen. So we're going to hear from our preacher. Amen. And he's going to bless us today with what the Lord has laid on his heart. Amen. To tell us. Amen. Along with himself, I always remind people the word. When the Lord gives it to you, guess what? He gives it to you for a reason. <laughs> because he, he, gives, he wants you to, to get it first. Amen. And then it's just like water going downhill. Uh, amen. And then the road flows down to everyone else. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord right now for this preacher as he comes to us. Amen. <laughs> Let us look to the Lord, our Father and our God. We, uh, we're 
grateful and uh, we're thankful for your, your goodness and your mercy, your faithfulness, your love, your guidance. We're thankful for your spirit. We're thankful for your willingness to forgive us to die for us. We thank you. And so we pray now that you would um, preach your word. I've done my best. But I know in me and through me you can do better. So I pray now that you would use me. But don't leave me out. I want to hear everything you've got to say. So when it's all said and done, help me to remember and help me to do according to your will and your way. Forgive me, cleanse me, make me right. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch Rodney. Just a touch. Put the doctors and the medication and everything to shame. Just a touch from you. We'll make him all right. So if there's anything that we're doing that's hindering you from hearing or answering our prayers, we pray in the name of Jesus, forgive us. Get us right. Because you said whatsoever things we ask for when we pray, believe that we receive them and we have them. So we're believing right now that Rodney is healed in the name of Jesus. Bless his wife, bless his family, bless this branch of Zion. Bless us right now in the name of Jesus, I pray and ask it all, amen. Amen, 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 amen. amen. I give honor to God to uh, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to uh, to I was looking for my son. I guess he didn't make it. Pray for Richard Jr. Uh, give honor to your pastor. Um, he will always be a big brother of mine. We need to be more in touch. Uh, I need to do better. Uh, thank God for your kids. Um, Brother Kyle, congratulations. God bless the educational ministry um, to his parents, to all of the parents who have young kids. God bless you. Um, we got girls that want to be boys, and we got boys that want to be girls, and they're saying God made them that way. God bless your parents because you're sending them out there hoping for the best. Every now and then I suggest you go with them because the devil wants them. He had me and I'm sure he had some of y'all. Fortunately enough, you were able to escape. And now you're in the light. The kids have to walk in our light until they understand that it's theirs too. So I encourage you, stay on top of your children before the devil gets on top of them. That's not my sermon. But when I saw them up here, we don't have any young people in the church I attend. And without another generation, 
trying to lock the doors because we're going to die. And then where is the church left? So we have work to do. I encourage you. Keep bringing them. And as they get older, they ain't going to want to come. Keep bringing them. Let them get mad. Let them miss out on something. I would rather you miss out on that than on that. So with that being said, you got, you got work to do. Mount Nebo, you got work to do. I'm just saying, I, I, I'm not a pastor. It scares me to think about pastoring. That scares me. But anyway, as always, I'm glad to be here. Um, when I come to Mount Nebo, I feel as though I've been to church. A lot of churches don't do hymns. You might hear one prayer. And they're worried about getting you in and getting you out. So they can get the next offering in and out. So God bless you. All right, I'm not going to be long is my prayer. We're going to look at Luke chapter 10. And we're going to start with the 25th verse. Luke chapter 10, the 25th verse. And I'll be reading from the uh, New King James translation. I also want to bring greetings from my pastor, uh, Dr. Willie T. Lawson and the Mount Pern Church family. Luke, 20, Luke 10, verse 25. I hear the pages. So. so when you've got it, say amen. amen. All right, thank you. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? You may be seated. I want to talk for a moment from the subject, a messed up mind and a hard heart. A messed up mind and a hard heart. So the setting is Jesus is teaching. And I would imagine you had scribes, Pharisees and priests in the audience. And so he's teaching, and you can imagine if you've ever been in a, a setting where the group sort of sat together, that they probably started whispering amongst themselves. And they're probably talking about the fact that Jesus didn't go to school where we went to school. Jesus doesn't have any degrees or certificates of achievement. Matter of fact, he doesn't have an office anywhere. But he's teaching us. Yeah. That's part of the conversation, I'm assuming. And so 
The Bible says that a certain lawyer stood up. And it says, he said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, don't lose sight of the fact that this is a learned individual. He knows the five books of the Bible. He knows the law. And what he wants to do is he wants to challenge Jesus because he is a lawyer, scribe. He is well learned. As a matter of fact, he is the one that they come to for answers regarding the law. But here comes Jesus, and one thing about Jesus, he always draws attention. And if you like your attention, he just might take your attention too if you let him. So this is what happens. So he stands up and he says, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, this learned guy doesn't quite understand. And you know he doesn't understand because, how he, because of how he forms his question. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? News flash. You, me, he can't do anything to inherit eternal life. If it's an inheritance, it's given. And not because of what you do, but because of where you stand. So if you stand as a child, your parents or your guardians will allow you to inherit just based on where you stand. You don't have to do anything. I just saw my son pull up. So when he comes in, I'm just going to do like this. So you don't have to do anything. Don't ever think that your doing is going to get you anywhere. You do because you're already there. You can't work in the church and think because you work in the church that when you get to glory, he's going to commend you for working in the church. Because folk in the church saved. Ain't no work to do, truth be told. Supposed to be, but I'm going to assume. So there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. So the first thing he does is he answers the, he asks the wrong question. But then Jesus is so smooth. And they said back in that time that it was common for the scribe, when he would ask a question, that another scribe would ask the same question or question back to him. In other words, we say don't ask a question with a question, but it was normal for them to ask a question and then get a question. So Jesus asked him a question. And this is what he says. What's written in the law, and what is your reading of it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Jesus says to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. I'm telling you, Jesus is so smooth because basically what Jesus has said, if you can keep all the laws, you're in. That's what he said. If you, if, not, only, if, not only if you can, if you have. The problem is we're born lost. We're born sinners. We're born needing a savior. But this is the lawyer who knows. Listen, 
There is nothing worse. No, let me say it this way. The only thing worse than an uneducated know-it-all is an educated know-it-all. Listen, I had to teach Sunday school this morning. I would have been here for your Sunday school, but this is my month to teach. Verse 20. One of the members, now I told him when I got up this morning, I'm going to rush. I don't have a lot of time. I need to leave at 930. I got to go up the road. Everybody else is okay. I got one guy right here on the front row. <laughs> so Rodney, he, he, when I get down to, you're ready to read verse 23, he wants to go back to 20. So he, he starts to talk, and he's reading the commentary. I got to go. He's reading the commentary. So as he starts, and he doesn't have a mic, I invite him up to where I'm standing. I said, okay, come on here. I'm thinking he's just going to expound. He's reading the commentary. So I had to politely say, okay, I got what you're saying, so what's your point? Well, the point is in the commentary, okay? But if you read the commentary, you should have grabbed something out of the commentary and you should be able to squeeze that thing. I gotta go. So he says a few more words and I said, we well, you know, thank you. Well, he sat down and the looks that brother was giving me this morning, I mean, this is the older guy on the, man, he was gritting at me. He was gritting at me, I guess either because I didn't, my method of teaching is a little different, and Mount Perrin knows how I do. I want you to think about the text. I'm not just going to read it and hope you got it. You're going to tell me what you read. And, and so what I did, I'm going to show you too. What I did was I did uh, questions. I did fill in the blank tied to the verse. Fill in the blank tied to the verse. All the way down. All you had to do was put a couple of words in there. I meant to bring it in here, and, but... But the point I'm making is, you got people in church. And here's the thing, I used to be one. I used to come in and try to teach the Sunday school lesson from the pew. Y'all know them? He got the book. I ain't even read the lesson. But I'm running my mouth messing up the whole class because I think I know what I don't even know. And so you got a lawyer, an educated person who thinks he knows. And what Jesus is trying to do, Jesus wants to get him to think about what's going on. And so when he says, what is your reading? And he reads it, he, he, he may read it, but I don't know if he hears what he's reading. But Jesus says, okay, you know what? Fine. If you can do that, you'll live. So then the Bible says in 29, but he wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Yeah. <laughs> now, what happened to the God part? What, 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 what hap why didn't you say uh, something along the lines of, Lord, the Lord, Lord, Lord I, I need to love God. You're concerned about who your neighbor is? No, you just want to trip Jesus up. Now, anybody living for any period of time should know by now, Jesus is the law. How in the world are you going to... Jesus gave you sense enough to go to school to learn the law. Jesus gave you... He gave you the air to breathe to sit in class, to be able to, he gave you the ability to go home and rest and prepare. And you're gonna question Jesus. It's okay to question Jesus when you want an answer. But don't question Jesus because you think you can prove him wrong. So this is what the lawyer does. So then 
So then Jesus, like I said, he's so smooth. If you're like me, I like movies. I like Denzel movies. And there's a movie called Man on Fire. You ever seen that movie? Man, that, I've seen it 20 times. It's one line in that movie. One line in the movie. Uh, Creasy's been shot. He's in the hospital. And the other guy, his buddy, I can't think of his name, but he's talking to the, the, the news guy. I think he's the news guy. Or police, I don't know what it is. But he's talking to him, he's sitting down, and he says, Creasy is an artist. And he is about to paint his masterpiece. Jesus is about to paint his masterpiece. And the reason I say this, because now this part ought to draw you in, because you need to hear what the Samaritan is all about. So we're going to take the focus off the fool for a while. And we're going to grasp the story that Jesus tries to tell. Because we're dealing with a messed up mind. This guy's mind is not working properly. He's not thinking. So Jesus wants to help him think properly. So he goes into the story. Some say it's a parable. Some say it's a story. Some say it, it, that because of the nature of Jer Jericho to Jerusalem and the road coming from Jerusalem down to Jericho, that this road exists. They call it, some call it a bloody path. So we don't really know what it is. But some Bibles will even say the parable of the Good Samaritan. Some will just say the Good Samaritan. But we know ain't no good nobodies. We do know that. Ain't none of us good. We're not good how we can do good. But we in ourselves ain't worth two cents. Don't forget that. I said two cents. That, that's, that's a, we ought to embrace that. That keeps you from thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You ain't worth nothing. Right. Nothing. Right. But when God got a hold of you, yeah. Yeah, sure. when he put something on the inside of you, you now you got treasure in you. So he says, verse 30, then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing wounded him and departed, leaving him for dead. So now we have this certain guy who, coming from Jerusalem to Jericho, he probably just left church. He probably just left the worship experience. And now he's on his way to Jericho. And while on his way to Jericho, they tag him. They jump him. They take all his clothes, probably left him in his drawers if they were nice. But they take, if he had a sack, they took that. But that wasn't good enough. They beat him. And they beat him so bad that when they left him, he was half dead. When Jesus came for us, you know what the devil had done? He mugged us. He got a hold of us. He beat us with the world. He beat us with bad choices. Because some of the choices we made when we were in the world, we're living with now. He beat us. He bruised us. And he left us half dead. But then the story goes on to say, now a certain, now by chance, a certain priest came down the road. And when that priest saw him, he passed on by the other on uh, by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite, when he arrived at this at that place, he came and he looked and passed by on the other side. So now some will say, well, uh, they were coming from church, and because some folk like to beat up on preachers and deacons and officers in the church. <laughs> so they'll say they'll say, well, it was the preacher, the pastor, and he came down and. Saw it, it's like, I ain't got time. I got my good clothes on. Uh, I, I got another service to attend to. I got a revival to go start. And so what he does is he goes by on the other side of the street. Now, some would say that the priest, according to the law, was not to come near a corpse. But he didn't get, get close enough to see whether he was living or dead. The Bible says he was half dead. He saw him from a distance and assumed 
I can't do that. So he goes around on the other side. So now the priest has come and gone. But now you got the Levite. Now the Levite, his rules are not as strict as the priest. So he, he does, he comes a little closer. And he looks, and he goes around the other side. Now, I'm only hoping that the audience is listening because really he's making the priest and the Levite look good so far. So they, they might be sitting there with their chests out. You know, yeah, that, that's, how, that's how we roll. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're doing according to the law. But then Jesus, oh man, then he gets the little fine paintbrush out. And he starts to paint it this way. He says, but. I love the word but in the Bible. Because basically what's happening is we're getting ready to do a 180. We're getting ready to flip the script. And he flips it in such a way that it really draws him in. Because he says, but a certain Samaritan. Jews hate Samaritans. Jews despise Samaritans. But a Samaritan, as he was journeying, came where he was. As a believer, I'm responsible to always be on the move. Can't be lazy as a believer. Because when you're moving, that's how God works with you. When you're on the path, God puts things in your path. That's how the world gets to see who we are. When we represent him by first walking in the light, walk where Jesus is. That's what the Samaritan is doing. He is journeying. He is on his way somewhere. And then he came to where the beating, and, 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 and let's, let's be reminded of this. That wasn't a Samaritan that was laying on the ground. That was a Jew. So that church, that, that priest, that pastor came down, saw his fellow member, and walked around. The Levite, the deacon, or whoever he was, did the same thing and walked around. Let me tell you something. If you're in Christ, you can't do that. If you're in Christ, you can't ignore what God puts in your path. Right. He puts it in your path for a reason. And the reason is he wants to get glory out of your life. That's the only reason he left you here. If he thought you weren't going to do anything when he saved you, he should have took you, would have took you home. But he, had let, he, he left work for us. And so the work is, this guy is coming, he's on a journey, and he sees somebody that needs help. Now, granted, you can't help everybody, but you ought to be able to help somebody. So he comes, and so he, what he does is, he takes out of his bag, why, why in the world does he have it? But he's got bandages, and he's got oil, he's prepared. He's got wine. He's got everything he needs, but he just doesn't have it. He uses it. And he bandages the guy. He puts the oil and he puts the, the, the wine on him because he wants to help him in his condition. But then he just doesn't help him in his condition and leave him. Then he puts him in his Lincoln. He puts him in his Cadillac. He puts them in your brand new Volvo Mercedes SUV. And, and then he said, look. And then he took him to the hotel. He didn't take him to the motel. He took him to the Marriott. I'm not going to say the West Story or whatever the big hotel. He took him to the Marriott. And then the Bible says that he stayed with him through the night and he took care of him. But wait a minute, he had somewhere to go. So what? He was on the path. Jesus put the guy on his path. 
And he said, you know what? Because Jesus put him on my path, and my path is Jesus wherever you want me to go, and whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. So whatever I got to do on my journey, it'll get there when I get there. But in the meantime, I'm going to do what you say do. So he helped him, picks him up, puts him in the hotel room, and he stays with him overnight. But then it gets better because in the morning, he doesn't leave him without saying to the guy at the front desk, hey, listen, I know I brought this guy in here last night. He was in bad shape. He's still in bad shape. So I can't put him out, and I'm not going to put him on you. So let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my American Express card. And I'm going to leave the card with you. Whatever it takes, I need you to do something. I need you to take care of him. Whatever it costs, I need you to take care of him. Why am I saying that? Because Jesus did the same thing for me. God sent his son to die for me. And you know what? He didn't say, I'm going to try this. And I'm gonna. He, gave, he started with his best. And he gave us Jesus Christ. And the guy said, listen, when I come back, because see, this is my road. This is how I travel. When I come back, if I owe you anything else, I got you. You know why? I got you, because he got me. So whatever's necessary, I got you. Listen, for us, it's all about compassion and mercy. We live in a world now where it's I, iPhone, Facebook, MySpace. Everything is about me being self-centered. And if I have time, I'll deal with you and I'll deal with your issue. God said, I didn't do that to you. Don't do that to me. I sent my son to suffer, to bleed, and to die. For me, man. Oh, man, if you know from whence I've come. Huh? So now, Jesus is going to put it back into the hands of the lawyer. So he asked one more question. He says, out of these three, who was the neighbor? And this is where the hard heart exists. Because he didn't say the Samaritan. He just said the one who is my neighbor. He was still lost. I'm not saying he died lost. But for some folk, at some point in their life, even Jesus isn't enough. Why couldn't he just say, I heard what you said? That's what I need to do. See, for an Israelite to call someone a neighbor had to be a fellow Jew. Samaritan couldn't be my neighbor here or here. He couldn't be in my neighborhood. He was there. I, I'm a, I, we got the, we're the, we're the chosen people. I, I can't, we, we, he can't be my neighbor. Hey, let me tell you. Red, yellow, black, and white. In Christ, whoever is in your neighborhood is your neighbor. And whoever you can help, you need to help. Why is that so important? Because the Bible says that at that day, we all have to give an account. We all have to stand before the Lord and say absolutely nothing because he's going to read it off to you. All you're talking is now. 
But when we stand before the God of our salvation, right. ain't nothing to say. You stand up there with a blank piece of paper, but he got a video. And he got a big old screen. And it's better you not say anything because you're going to lie. <laughs> or you're going to misunderstand. And what I mean by that is you can't do anything to save yourself. If you think, if you're working to impress Rodney, or if you're working to impress the deacons, or if you're working to, to, to impress God, in other words, that's your motive, you're wasting your time. But if you do because it's in you to do when you can't help but do, now God is working on the inside of you, and you don't have to say anything. And you don't have to get kudos for what you did because you ain't doing it for kudos. You know, you ever, walk, you ever walk in a store? And I'm sure, and I used to do this. You, open, you walk in the store and you open the door. Come on, y'all, be honest with me too. And you hold it for somebody and they don't say thank you. <laughs> what you, huh? So my, here's my question. Why did you hold the door open? Did you hold the door open so they could say thank you? Your motives are off. I do because God did for me. He opened the door and let me come to a place where I could be inherited, where I can be adopted, and now I'm in his family. You mean to tell me somebody got to say thank you to you because you held the door open? They could have done it themselves, truth be told. And if that's your thinking, just let them do it. Just leave the door and let it slam in their face if that's your makeup. But the point I'm, make, the point I'm making is everything we do, we do to the glory of God. Everything we do. I encourage you not to live with a messed up mind. Come to Bible study. Come to Sunday school. Hear what's being said, what's being read, what's being taught. And then meditate on it. Let, let it marinate. Because listen, not until it gets in the oven will, will God start to do anything spiritually. Because if you just hear it, it goes in one ear and out the other. You ain't, you ain't even trying to get it. But when you come and you hear, and let me tell you, when you get it, then teach your children. Don't be ashamed to teach your children. Don't be ashamed to teach your children the word of God. Memory verses. I've learned, listen, I've started to turn the TV off. I've, because that stuff gets in you. And then you wonder why you can't sleep. Because we fill ourselves, I've been guilty, we fill ourselves with all of that nonsense, with all of that garbage. I sleep so much better now, Rodney, because I don't take the garbage in. I get this in me now. I've got a grip on his gripping me. And I'm so, man, let me tell you, I'm so, to have Richard here, oh man, how many years? I don't know how many years we've been going at it. Back and forth. Last year, last week, right in, and listen, last time I came, I brought my daughter. I don't even take them to where I go to church. But this is church to me. This is, when you guys stand up there and you pray in the morning, those kids sung four songs this morning. You acknowledge your youth. You, you, you all participate. I grew up in that. And I think we've lost it in the city because we want to impress and be impressed. But I'm going to tell you, don't lose what you have. Don't lose what you have. I'm not a hooper. I holler at now and then, but I, I, don't, I don't. I just can't help it. But I just want us to think. And then the heart. Don't, don't, don't let your heart grow hard for any reason. Don't let people make you mad, and then you take it out on somebody else. The Bible says, pray for them. Love the hell out of them. Because then you represent correctly. 
Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. God bless you. We stand. God, I pray that um, my ways are received and your word makes an impact on the lives of all of us who are here. Thank you for your written word. Uh, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you are not saved, you are who he died for. Wherever you are in life, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I know where you sit or where you stand, it may be hard to believe that God loves you. But um, where you stand could not have been any worse than where I stood. And I'm an open book as far as to a point. There's some chapters you can't read. But for the most part, I'm an open book to where I've been and what I've done. And only God could have delivered me. And so I'm saying that to say that wherever you are and whatever you've done, he died, Jesus Christ died died for you. Now, there's no great expectation that when you give your life to Christ and everything is going to be hunky-dory, picture perfect. It's not. There is a process. And for all of us who are saved, ain't no, none of us near finish the process. All of us have got to go through. You've got to start somewhere, though. And this is where you start. You just say, you know what? I'm tired of living this life. I'm a sinner. I ain't worth two cents. I need a savior. Wretched, filthy, dirty sinner. But God sent his son to die for you. And spiritually, when you say, you know what, Jesus, I want to be saved. I want you to lord over my life. The blood of Jesus that you don't see washes you spiritually. He cleanses you. To the point where you don't ever have to remind yourself of what you were because now the Bible says you are a new creature in Christ. You got some old stuff in you. And that's why we encourage you to come to Bible study and prayer meeting and pray and do your own reading so that you can learn how to live spiritually so that you no longer live according to the flesh. Doesn't mean you can't have fun. Doesn't mean you, 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 Friday night I went to see Marcus Miller. That was good. <laughs> I just don't indulge like everybody else. But I'm not going to take life, I'm, I'm not going to miss out on life. Marcus Miller, bad, that brother played that, he played that boy bad. I enjoy music, I enjoy cars. Listen. I'm living now more than I ever have in my life. And on top of that, I'm getting my kids back. Yeah. Nothing more important than family. But listen, there's a Christian family that we want you to be a part of. There's a spiritual family that we want you to be a part of. And that spiritual family will teach you how to love those ungodly members in your family. Because we practice love here. We practice here and we work it out out there. So if you're not saved, I encourage you, try. You try everything else. 
Try Christ. Listen, and if you hang in there long enough, some of the stuff you're trying, you won't have to try that anymore because you'll find everything you need in Christ and in his word. So I encourage you to come. I encourage you. Then if you're out there and you're a member here and you want to come back home, I always tell people now, your seat's right there. Come on home. If you had a beef, you squash the beef. Because you got to deal with the beef when you deal with God. Squash the beef, come on home. Because you need to be in the household of faith. You need to be among other believers. You can't do it sitting at home watching the Word Channel. I'm sorry. Just not going to, because you don't know what they're telling you, if it's true or not. Come on in here. And if you're looking for a church home and you're close by, listen. I, when Rodney calls me and says, come to Mount Nebo, I'm there. Because you've always, you've always shown me love. Now, you might not like what I say, but you show me love. And so this is a loving church. Come on to Mount Nebo. If you don't want to do any three of those, listen, find a church. Because it ain't going to be long. He's coming back. He's coming back. So I pray, God, that we've done what you've asked us to do. They have a decision to make. God bless you. Man, y'all make it too easy. <laughs> so again, uh, big brother, Pastor Smith, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all for allowing me to share. God bless you, brother, for showing up a little late. But you're here. That's all that matters. Hey, never too late to come to the house of God. Let us look to the Lord. Gracious Father in heaven, again, we just say thank you because you're just so good to us. Uh, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And the church of God said, Amen. 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 Amen.